Welcome to Dark Crossroads Podcast, hosted by Roxanne Fletcher. This is your stop for all things true crime and paranormal. From the infamous story of the New Bedford Highway Killer to the chilling tale of the Black Eyed Children, Dark Crossroads Podcast is a truly deep dive into the stories that frighten and fascinate you. All links to the show will be provided in this episode's description. And don't forget to let us know what you think of today's episode wherever you listen to podcasts. On the banks of the Red River in Robertson County lies the sleepy town of Adams, Tennessee. With a population at only 624, you might think that this area often gets overlooked. However, for many decades, the town has captured the attention of ghost hunters, historians, and paranormal enthusiasts from all over the world. This is because it is the site of the infamous haunting of the Bell Witch. On a secluded farm in this sleepy town lies the Bell Family Farm and the Bell Witch Cave. One of the most documented cases of a haunting in American history, most people have heard the story of the Bell Witch. Not only is it the most widely documented paranormal event, the case of the Bell Witch is also the only time a death has been officially attributed to a supernatural entity. The site of the haunting on the Bell Farm is also considered to be one of the most haunted places in America to this day. John Bell was born in Halifax County, North Carolina in 1750, the son of William Bell and Ann Jones. In 1782, John Bell married Lucy Williams, daughter of prominent farmer John Williams of Edgecombe County, North Carolina. The Bells bought a farm in Edgecombe County and began amassing wealth and influence around the area. In 1804, the family, consisting of John and Lucy Bell, and their children, Jesse, John Jr., Drury, Benjamin, Esther, Zadok, Elizabeth, Richard Williams, and Joel Edgbert built a house and started a farm on 1,000 acres located on the Red River in Robertson County, Tennessee. Of their children, Benjamin died as a young child. Zadok became a prominent lawyer and moved to Mississippi, where he also died relatively young. Esther married Bennett Porter in 1817. Jesse married Martha Gunn, daughter of Reverend Thomas Gunn, and later moved to Mississippi. John Bell Jr. married Elizabeth Gunn, also daughter of Reverend Thomas Gunn, and became a successful farmer in Robertson County. Drury never married and owned a farm on the north side of the Red River. Elizabeth, who was also known as Betsy Bell, eventually married her former teacher, Richard Powell, and moved to Mississippi. Richard Williams Bell was married three times to Sally Gunn, also another daughter of Thomas Gunn, Susan Gunn, daughter of Reverend James Gunn, and Eliza Orndorff. He lived out his life in Robertson County. The youngest child, Joel Edgbert, married twice and moved to Springfield. Despite the lasting impact of what the Bells had titled their family trouble, the family continued to flourish and still live in Tennessee to this day. Starting in 1817, a little over a decade after the Bell family had first bought their farm in Adams and moved in, John Bell and his family began hearing strange noises. Thumps in the walls, creaking and groaning, scratching at the windows. Nothing ordinary explained away the noises, but the family were not overly concerned until the violence began. The haunting soon escalated to physical attacks. The children were pulled from their beds, and unseen hands pinched and slapped the family. Most of the phantom abuse was centered on Betsy, John Bell's daughter, and also on John Bell himself. Sometimes the phenomena would speak. It would hurl insults at John Bell as if it was angry with him. A few years after the haunting started, the entity took credit for Bell's sudden illness and demise, apparently poisoning Bell with a mysterious black liquid. For four years, the family were harassed by this mysterious and invisible spirit. The scariest thing about the Bell Witch story is not that a ghost terrorized a teenage girl or even that a ghost was held accountable for the death of a person. The scariest thing is that so many people have taken the Bell Witch story 
so seriously. It's not just a story. It's a well-documented event reported by multiple people. Many people reported hearing the voice of the bell witch or hearing the scratches and the knocks. Others also reported seeing strange animals on the property and floating orbs of light in the surrounding woods. The haunting of the bell witch takes many forms. The fact that the phenomena was not just witnessed by a few people in one household, but by many, is often found quite terrifying. According to legend, the bell witch had the ability to speak, shapeshift, and be in multiple places at one time. The origin of the legendary Bell Witch is, of course, a mystery still to this day. In early accounts, the spirit itself provides an origin story by stating, I am a spirit. I once was very happy, but I have been disturbed and made unhappy. I am the spirit of a person who was buried in the woods nearby, and the grave was disturbed, my bones disinterred and scattered, and one of my teeth was lost under this house. I am here looking for that tooth. Of course, this cannot be verified. However, a number of Indian burial mounds could be found along this region. In another event, the witch claimed to be a spirit from everywhere. Heaven, hell, the earth, in the air, the houses, any places at any time have been created millions of years ago. The first sign of anything weird happening around the Bell family is usually reported as an incident that happened on the farm in which John Bell fired a shot at a dog-like creature, which soon vanished afterwards. Drury and Betsy also began to see strange creatures near the property. These sights are accompanied by strange sounds around the house. Betsy John and Drury began to hear unexplained knocking on the doors and the windows, the sound of wings flapping against the ceilings, and the sound of rats gnawing on bedposts. Also, more disturbingly, the sound of choking and strangling could be heard, along with chains dragging and heavy objects hitting the floor, sounds emanating from the bedroom as if beds were suddenly and roughly pulled apart, to which was added the sounds of fighting dogs chained together, making the noise deafening. In all cases, the source of the noise was never found. No rats were found in the home despite thorough searching, and no damage to any of the furniture was ever discovered. During these demonstrations, the family refused to speak of the events to their neighbors. The spirit increased its activity throughout time, sometimes physically abusing the members of the family. Jewel, Richard Williams, and especially Betsy were subjected to being struck, pinched, and having their hair pulled relentlessly by the Bell Witch. Lucy Bell and John Jr. were left relatively unharmed by the witch. Lucy was proclaimed by the spirit to be the most perfect woman alive. And the witch showed a great deal of compassion toward her, even caring for her and singing to her while she was ill. John Jr. had long, intense conversations with the witch, but he never failed to show his animosity for it, declaring it to be the spirit of the damned. As stated before, it was John Bell and his daughter Betsy who received most of the abuse. The witch then began speaking and having full conversations with most of the members of the family. Oftentimes, it directed insults and threats at John Bell. On one relatively famous occasion, the witch recited perfectly the sermon of Reverend James Gunn of Bethel Methodist Church, followed by the sermon of Sug Fort. Despite the fact that they had originally been given at the same time, more than 12 miles apart. Family friend William Porter claimed the witch climbed into bed with him, allowing him the opportunity to seize the spirit in the bedclothes and attempted to throw it into the fire, saying only the immense weight and terrible smell of it prevented him from succeeding. The witch had a dislike for the family's slaves, tormenting them relentlessly, beating them, and refusing to allow them into the house. A bell slave named Dean stated he encountered the witch several times, and that it appeared frequently in the form of a large black dog or wolf, sometimes with two heads, sometimes with no head. Dean also claimed 
to be turned into a mule and attacked several times by the witch. He carried with him at all times his axe and a witch ball made by his wife as protection from the witch's influence. In one instance, the witch set three dogs named Caesar, Tyke, and Bulger on traveling shakers who would never travel by the farm after that day. In another incident, neighbor and husband of Esther Bell, Bennett Porter, fired a shot at a naughty log that had been conjured upon by the witch. She struck the bark and cut into it, but the conjuration vanished. Only the bent tree and bullet hole remained. Another incident was Dr. Mize, who at the time was a noted conjurer from Simpson, Kentucky, came to exorcise the witch out of the family's home, but was mocked, scared, and frightened away to never return. Legend has it that the Bell Witch even had an encounter with the then-future President Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson owned property along the Red River and very much desired to visit the Bell Farm after hearing all of the stories. On his travel into the farm, one of his wagons became stuck by an unseen force, and it could not be moved, despite trying to get the horses to pull it out, examining the wheels, and having it pushed by men in his party. He exclaimed, By the eternal boys, this is the witch. And to this, the witch replied, All right, General, let the wagon move on. I will see you again tonight. The wagon started off its own accord, and they continued along their journey. That evening at camp, a self-proclaimed witch layer or witch hunter said that he had a silver bullet and regaled the men with tales of hunting witches. As you can imagine, this was along the time of the Salem witch trials and the hysteria along that. Jackson whispered to a colleague, I'll bet this fellow is an errant coward. By the Eternals, I do wish the thing would come. I want to see him run. After which silence followed. Suddenly, there was a sound of light footsteps prancing on the floor, and the voice stated, All right, General, I am on hand and I am ready for business. The witch started taunting the witch hunter to shoot, but the gun could not fire. The hunter was struck by an unseen force, claimed to feel the pain of being stuck by needles, exclaimed he had been grabbed by the nose, and fled from the tent. The witch then exclaimed, How the devil did run and beg. I'll bet he won't come through here again with his old horse pistol to shoot me. I guess that's fun enough for tonight, General, and you can go to bed now. I will come tomorrow night and I will show you another rascal in this crowd. Jackson was eager to stay, but his party had enough, and Jackson returned to Nashville shortly after this. Now, I know that earlier in the story I mentioned that Betsy Bell, the one who was tormented probably the most by the Bell Witch, was married to her teacher from high school, but before that, there was somebody else. And for reasons still unclear, the witch adamantly opposed the union of childhood sweethearts. Betsy Bell and Joshua Gardner frequently resorted to ruthless taunts and physical abuse. Joshua and Betsy remained attached, but she put off marriage in fear of the spirit's disapproval of their companionship. The witch's attacks on Betsy were not all related to her relationship with Gardner, and the constant threat of the witch began to affect her such that she became prone to fainting spells and smothering sensations, often appearing exhausted and lifeless. Her experiences were not confined to the Bell property either. Betsy later described one incident. When the spirit became so tantalizing, filling my mind with horror and causing me to become so nervous, my parents often sent me to a neighbor's to rest for a night. My first night away from home was spent with Deanie Thorne. When we retired, there came a loud knocking on our outside door, which seemed to fly open, and a great gust of wind was felt. Thini sprang up at once and lit a candle, and to our surprise, the door was not open. Then a voice spoke softly, Betsy, you should not have come over here. You know I can follow you anywhere. Now get a good night's sleep. A soft hand patted my cheek, and the voice again assured us that we would not 
be disturbed anymore that night. The rest of the family often attempted to give Betsy relief, and family friend Frank Miles promised to protect Betsy from any further abuse by the spirit. Betsy said that Frank was the most powerful man any of us ever saw, and just as fearless as any living man, one time he said to me, Come sit by me, little sister. Nothing will bother you while I am here. The witch responded, You go home. You can do no good here. The witch then began abusing Betsy, slapping her, pulling her hair before turning on Miles, knocking him over, and enraging him. Betsy continued to endure the spirit's abuse, and after calling off the marriage to Joshua Gardner, Betsy was eventually courted and married to her former school teacher, Richard Powell. Despite the apparent end of the witch's torments, in 1820, she left the area with her husband and settled in Mississippi. At this point in the story, I'm going to introduce you guys to a key person in this story. Mary Catherine Kate Batts, the wife of Frederick Batts, was believed by many to have been the culprit behind the disturbances known as the Bell Witch. Although she was not a poor woman, she was often mocked by others throughout the Red River settlement in Robertson County. Her improper usage of words, along with her sometimes strange ways, led many to think that she was practicing black magic or other forms of the occult. In the early years of the century, Benjamin Batts, the brother of Frederick Batts, so that would be her brother-in-law, had a dispute with John Bell over the cell of a slave. Facts of the dispute were later tangled and became the source of a rumor to the effect that John Bell and Kate Batts had the quarrel, and that the Bell Witch was created by Kate Batts to get revenge on Bell. While there are plenty of stories connecting the Bell Witch to Kate Batts and some sort of disagreement that did exist between her and John Bell, recent evidence suggests that she had nothing to do with it. In fact, contrary to reports of her claiming that she would get even with John Bell while on her deathbed, Kate Batts actually outlived John Bell by many years. Today, there are many descendants of the Batts family living in Cheatham, Montgomery, and Robertson County. Though it played a relatively minor role in the original Bell Witch legend of the early 19th century, there was a cave, and the cave on John Bell's property has since become a focal point for visitors hoping to experience a bit of the haunting themselves. Added to the National Historical Registry in 2008, this cave is the only original feature from the legend that can still be seen today, largely unchanged from the way the Bell family would have seen it in 1817. Though numerous eerie events have been reported by visitors to the cave, including the renowned difficulty in taking photographs around the site in the pre-digital age, nothing on the scale of the original haunting centered around the Bell House, long since torn down, has been reported since the early 1800s. It seemed to be that one of the main goals that this spirit had was to be the cause of death of John Bell Sr., or as the spirit liked to call him, old Jack Bell. Bell was blasted with curses, heinous threats, and serious physical torment. As the abuse continued to impact his psyche, John Bell took to his bed and was cared for by his son, John Jr. On December 19, 1820, John failed to leave his bed, and John Jr. went to the cupboard to get the medicine for his care. Instead of three medicine vials being there, he found only one vial. It was third full of dark, smoky liquid of unknown origin. Suddenly, the voice of the witch gloated, It's useless for you to try to relieve old Jack. I have got him this time. He will never get up from that bed again. She claimed of the vial that she gave old Jack a big dose of it last night while he was fast asleep and that it fixed him. The contents of the vial were thrown into the fire and erupted into a blue blaze. John Bell died December 20th, 1820, a day after this incident. And, of course, the Bell Witch crashed the funeral, disrupting the service and singing inappropriate songs. Following his death, and after three years of non-stop attacks and harassments, 
The constant hauntings and abuse lessened, and then eventually stopped altogether, just as mysteriously as they had begun. The spirit was still active through the winter and spring of 1821, but it soon bade the family farewell, telling them that it would be gone only for seven years. True to its word, the family remaining on the property, Lucy, Richard Williams, and Joel, claimed the witch did return in February of 1828, reappearing in much the same way that it appeared the first time, with the shaking of beds and unexplained noises. It soon vanished again, claimed it would return to haunt the Bell descendants once again in 1935, but no other specific hauntings of the Bell family or their property on the level experienced in the early 19th century have ever been reported. Despite this, unexplained activity in and around the Bell Farm in Adams, Tennessee continues to this day. Various encounters near the property, along the old Nashville-Clarksville Road, and in the famous Bell Witch Cave still draw tourists and ghost hunters to Adams. And though the haunting stopped suddenly after John Bell's death, the story did not die in 1828. On the contrary, in the years after the haunting has ended, the story was often shared and retold throughout the area. In Clarksville, newspaper publisher Martin V. Ingram would have heard the Bell Witch story retold often as he was growing up. Over 50 years after the initial haunting, Ingram came into the possession of a written account of Richard William Bell's experience of the haunting. Titled Our Family's Trouble, Martin V. Ingram used this manuscript as a primary source to publish an official account of the Bell Witch haunting. Martin Ingram's book, An Authenticated History of the Famous Bell Witch, was published in Clarksville in 1894 and is the first instance of the entire story being printed and sold to the public. Martin V. Ingram is buried in Greenwood Cemetery, so on the historic Greenwood Cemetery walking tour, you can hear a little about some of the spooky trouble Ingram claimed to have experienced while printing his book. The legend of the Bell Witch has also inspired other books, documentaries, and movies, including the 2006 movie, An American Haunting. Today, anybody can be a part of the Bell Witch legend. The family that currently owns the site of the original Bell family farm offers tours of the property while they share the stories associated with the Bell Witch. For about $20, you can tour a replica of the Bell House, complete with a few artifacts from the original house. Included is also a tour inside a cave on the property, the Bell Witch Cave. It is creepy on its own, but when you know its reputation for its own strange activity, it's even more unnerving. Strange photos and unexplained phenomena are just the tip of the iceberg when you venture into the Bell Witch Cave. October is the best time to go for the ultimate experience. That time of year, all of Adams is primed to celebrate Bell Witch season. A museum and a production of a play about the Bell Witch can all be enjoyed in Adams, Tennessee every year. While many view the story of the Bell Witch as a local folktale, there are others who believe that the hauntings did in fact take place and that there is still supernatural activity connected to the land itself. To this day, thousands of people flock to Adams, Tennessee every year to visit the original site of the Bell Witch haunting in hopes to experience something paranormal for themselves. Just because the haunting of the Bell family apparently ended over 200 years ago, the tale of the Bell Witch is just as interesting and compelling today as it was in 1819. All right, guys, so thank you so much for hanging out again today. For more details on the podcast or the cases that we covered, then head on over to the website www.darkcrossroadspodcast.com where we have all of the episodes, um, information about the podcast, merch, and also a blog covering every single case and it going into more description including links to all the places that you need to make phone calls to or resources regarding the case. 
You can also find us on uh, most social media platforms. Don't forget to like, share, rate, review, subscribe wherever you're listening to us. You can subscribe to the podcast. There is a link in all episodes in the notes that will send you to our subscription page. And with that, you will get bonus content, discount on future merch, and a lot of other extra goodies and kind of behind the scenes information. Um, So every single donation through the subscription and any other place goes straight to the podcast. It helps fund research and it really helps us out to keep this podcast going. So before I go, I just want to thank all of my listeners for your continued support and for sending in cases that you wanted covered and stories that you wanted read on the podcast. We truly accept all stories, scary, paranormal, um, funny, anything that you want read or you want me to know, send it in. And any cases that you want covered, please send in. You can email those to darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com. And with all of this said, Please don't forget to be weird, stay different, and don't trust anyone. Dark Crossroads Podcast is brought to you by Problem Wildlife. Problem Wildlife serves all of Western Massachusetts and has been humanely protecting your house and your family from unwanted pests for over 20 years. Take back your space with an animal control service that you can trust. They are family-owned, fully licensed, and are knowledgeable and dependable. To find out more about their services, simply visit their website at www.problemwildliferemoval.com. Again, that is www.problemwildliferemoval.com, and their information will be included in our show notes.